All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. I just wanted to say thank you so much for being here as part of our Hatfield Marine Science Center Research Seminar. Um, this is a hybrid event, so welcome to those folks that are online as well. Uh, my name is Cinnamon Moffat. I'm the Research Program Manager here at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center. Uh, we are located in Newport, Oregon for those folks that are online. We are just really, really excited that you are here. I have a few quick announcements and a couple of logistics to talk about. So for folks that are online, um, we have two folks that are in the room that will help you if you have any technical issues. Please use the chat and Michael um, will help out and let you know uh, what's going on and let me know if there's any issues. Uh, for folks in the room, if you have any questions at the end of today's talk, we will need to use a mic. So either raise your hand and I'll bring you this mic or you can go to the mic over on the stage uh, over to the side on the steps. For folks online, if you have questions at the end, just use that chat function um, and we'll get to those questions as we move through the, today's presentation. Wanted to make a quick announcement for next week's seminar. Um, same place, same time, just a week later. We have Dr. Ryan Tucker Jones um, from the University of Oregon who will be talking about Red Leviathans, the Soviet history of whaling. So that'll be a really interesting talk. So if you can join us, I encourage you to come on back. But for today, we have an exciting speaker that we are excited to have um, that was invited by our provost here at OSU. And so I'm actually gonna hand it off to Provost Fazer to introduce today's speaker. Thank you. Thanks everybody for coming out today to hear from Amos Gazet. Amos is a colleague and a friend of mine going back now about 15 years. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of background because I don't know how much he's gonna tell you about himself and he has a, an unusual background, and that's part of the, the story here. So he has almost has a long career in marine conservation uh, with a lot of different organizations, primarily in Southeast Asia and the Caribbean. And I met him back, I think, in 2007 in uh, Curacao when colleagues and I at the University of Illinois were doing some work uh, in Curacao around sustainable island development. And at that time, Amos was working with the Caribbean Research and Management of Biodiversity Foundation, or CARMABI, and he helped host our group and connect us to a lot of the, the leadership in, on Curacao and so on. We were combining a variety of, of scientists, natural scientists, and social scientists, and working on ways that Curacao might think about its development in more sustainable ways. So for those of us on the social science side, it had to do with thinking about uh, wealth creation, great, greater wealth creation without damage to the environment and on the natural science side on, on preservation and conservation. Um, two years later, colleagues and I developed a course on sustainable island development. I want to tell you some of the topics we covered because they're related to some of the things that almost has spent a lot of time thinking about. We, uh, we focused on the intersection of natural and, and social science as I I mentioned, by the way, my background is economic development and city planning. So I was one of the social scientists that was involved in this. Understanding of islands uh, and the sustainability issues, prospects, solutions, using islands as a lens to, to better understand sustainability uh, and think about both environmental and economic and social contexts. And we also covered how, how to rethink or, or ways we might rethink American cultural and sometimes romantic notions of, of what islands are, island society, island people. And particularly if you work in international development contexts, which almost has done a lot of in his career and I've done as well, you realize that you have to really guard against this notion that uh, that somehow they demand the altruism of the developed world uh, to necessarily solve their problems. Many of the solutions uh, are very much things that they would do better if they did not lean as heavily on the developed world. And I'm sure almost will refer to some of those things. And so I mention all these things because it speaks a little bit to what some of the conversations almost and I have had over many years. Now I'm completely useless in the scientific domain these days because as Cinnamon mentioned, I'm the provost, which means I spend most of my time as a bureaucrat. Um, but Amos and I uh, still talk about these things all the time. He's going to talk about his photography, uh, and he will say he's not a marine photographer. He's not a National Geographic guy uh, that takes beautiful uh, 
photographs intended for magazines and so on. And uh, he'll talk about how the fact that he's not technically trained, but there's a little bit of background here uh, in that um, what drew him to photography, actually what drew him to diving uh, were injuries he sustained uh, in uh, the war of attrition uh, on the Suez Canal. And I th injured three times, uh, which has created mobility and memory issues. But as I understand his life story, diving and photography have been a kind of a therapeutics for that. And you're going to hear uh, about that today. It's diving and is in some ways a way to free himself from physical uh, limitations. So he started documenting undersea life and the intent was not to be a technically skilled photographer, but to really, as I, as I read it, understand the challenges around sustainability and conservation uh, better. So he doesn't also think of himself as an artist, although now he's showing some of his photographs and other things that you'll see here uh, in galleries in Israel and the United States. So he'll, he'll talk about that as well. But I think, again, it's the, the art and the photography here is more about a different way of understanding a problem. Uh, and something I've really enjoyed engaging with Amos in now, as I said, about 15 years is the kind of synthetic way he sees a problem. Uh, and the different uh, ways that one can kind of frame solutions. So I think it's quite consistent with what we would like to achieve here at OSU when we talk about things like the Marine Studies Initiative. So delighted to have Amos here with us for a while, and he's taking photographs along the coast and getting to know Oregon a bit. And I'm glad you'll have a chance to hear from him today. So with that, I'll turn it over to him. Hello, everybody. <laughs> nice being here. Well, as uh, the provost said, I don't consider myself as a photographer. I don't consider myself as an artist, but I consider myself as something that uh, somebody that has imagination, has a will to learn and to study and has the will to challenge all the limitations that I face since the age of 24. The age of 24 it was my third injury in the army where I found myself with a lot of limitations but still with some qualities that I carried with me. As I said, one was a subject of being able to, to be sensitive enough to what's going on around me, to humankind problems and sometimes limitations, sometimes the fact that they had to face uh, the problem of how to survive in the toughest possible conditions. And using only my inherited morals and some qualities that I was aware of having it, because so I have been told, uh, I said, okay, this is what I have. With this one, I have to start the struggle of my life to see what I'm doing, where I'm going, and with not much help. Eventually, somehow, I got to a point where I started to be requested to find solutions, maybe mainly a livelihood related problems of communities located uh, next to the sea or living out of the sea when uh, suddenly they came to a situation that they had nothing to live off. It started by the way, not in the sea, it started by giving some advice to people that were trying to grow all kind of fish, prostitutions, whatever. And then, 
And this is something, and this is exactly uh, actually the moment that I bumped or I started my uh, love story or love affair with the sea. I was asked to give some advice to a big shrimp farm in the Philippines. I was invited by a consulting firm in the Philippines. And I arrived to the place and I saw uh, the technical problems that they were facing. Mainly what I can consider as managerial problems. Like how to save in energy because energy at the early 90s or late 80s started to be a crucial issue and a very expensive factor in production. And I was standing there and I was thinking that there is a very simple solution to save something like 75% of the cost of energy. And I was trying to give this advice to the owner of the farm. Obviously, I was kicked by the, the, the guy that invited me in the first place and said, Amos, shut up. You don't sell things for free. It worth a lot of money. And I said, Dr. Soler, it worth a lot of money, but it's so simple. How can you charge for it? And he said, go, 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 go. Stand over there. And I was standing on a hill behind me, this big shrimp farm. And in front of me, a beautiful blue bay. And then I said to myself two things. Down there, I should be. This is a place that I should go for. The second one was, why the hell people, and where is the sense behind taking animals from the sea? and trying to grow them on the land. Doesn't make sense. And then I went to the sea. I had to get the permission or the blessing of uh, somebody who is a good friend as well and was my physician. And he said, you are not allowed to dive. And I said, I am allowed to dive because I am responsible. I don't have to prove nothing to nobody if I don't feel well. If I see that there is a problem, I go out. And I went into the sea. And it was really great. First of all, you don't have any more uh, mobility or physical limitations. You fly inside the water. You don't have to walk fast. You don't have to walk slow. You don't fall. You don't nothing. And it's quiet. And then, obviously, the visions that you see. And let me go now. We'll drop this one. And we'll go to the first one. This is how looked the sea the first time that I came into it. Beautiful place, wonderful thing, very quiet, full of fish and colors and everything, just made me feel like you should stay there. Don't go out, stay forever. But quite, uh, but soon enough, you start to see what is happening under the water. You see what nature does, which is natural uh, thing, storms and destruction. But what was more uh, interesting and upsetting was what human beings are doing to the sea and how they destruct almost any chance to the future. And obviously, when they do it together, with their activities, which has to be, the, most of them were out of surviving uh, needs, like bringing food. But this one, together with the attitude towards the sea, which was a result of negligency, result of 
greediness and result of not being able to see what it will bring later on. And this is what I saw. And then I had to deal with the issue because eventually I came into the sea beside my own pleasure. I had to solve problems of the fishing communities or people that were living next to the sea and out of the sea. And what do I do in order to bring back some of what they had or any chance to continue to be able to live out of it? This is some of the things that I could find all over. Provost Fraser was uh, mentioning uh, Coruscant. Part of the things here are from Coruscant. By the way, under the nose of the Karmabi Foundation, which was supposed to look over preservation and the uh, nature reserves and everything. But this is what you could find all over the world, by the way. Obviously, it was affecting what is what was happening in terms of biodiversity, in terms of future chance to the place to be rehabilitated or being conserved. And actually, I didn't, in a certain point in time, very early, I said that conservation, it's a kind of a fake uh, description of what should be done because conservation is when you have to conserve something that exists. In most cases, it did not exist anymore. It was practically broken and destroyed. And therefore, I was aiming more on doing restoration of what used to be and trying to bring back some of what used to be over there. And then I was starting to think, okay, how, we do, how do we do it? Usually we had on the surface something that you know from here, from Oregon. I was not familiar. familiar. Uh, I was familiar with this geological structure but not with the temperature of the water that go there, I must admit. But at the same time, and you have it under the water, but practically it, was, it exists everywhere. This is the situation. You come and then you say, okay, now we have a desert after a sea storm, and then I don't have a desert, but I have a place that practically, as we know here in Oregon as well, uh, even the shells or any living creatures that were here, like for example, the abalone vanished or came to a situation that you can, you cannot take it out anymore. And now I said, okay, I was familiar with other practices in trying to restore and to rebuild reefs and to rebuild whatever, which didn't make sense to me. And therefore I was going over to the ob almost obvious and natural uh, solution for this one, remember, looking less at conservation because in most places that I was visiting, and it doesn't matter if it was in Southeast Asia, whether it was in the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, everywhere, you, you saw destruction, you saw problems that exist already. And to my opinion, there was no chance to conserve anything over there, but to restore more than to conserve. And then I said, okay, but I know, and we'll see it later on, the practices that were used in restoring or trying to rehabilitate. And it didn't make sense. And I said, why should people dump into the water so many kind of structures that eventually 
this uh, cause more damage than help while you have so many natural layers or structures inside the sea or out of the sea that you can use in order to restore and rebuild environments that used to be there. And this is where we took just simple rocks, dump them into the water, going again and getting one more advantage. First of all, being able to do it with human labor, very simple ways to do it. And suddenly you could, or you could also uh, generate and create livelihood and some income to the people that could not make it out of the sea anymore. They could go fishing, but they couldn't fish nothing. Now, we had the budgets, and never mind if the budget came from an international agencies, whether it's a, a, the FAO, whether it's a World Bank or a USAID in some, play, in some places, you had the budget. So take the budget that you get for rehabilitating a place or doing something to improve it and give some livelihood to the people. The one in the right, it's a fisherman. The one in the left, is by the way, an American soldier, when we were demonstrating how to start to build a small reef in a ruined area. And then we said, okay, now how do we attract the biodiversity over there? Because practically when you dump a stone inside the sea, Immediately you see movement around, but it's not enough because this one will last for some time, not too much. And at that point in time, started to go inside the subject of my photography, which was done for myself. I didn't think of any other reason to do it, but for myself, because of the colors, because of the shapes and because obviously believing that it will not last for long i didn't think that uh, i already could observe and could see that things are vanishing one day uh, any two used to happen as early as uh, during the 90s i came to a place i came back to the same place after three months and it was like somebody was killing anything that was living there before. If before you have biodiversity of, let's say, 20 fish per cubic meter, you came back, you saw suddenly something like well, maybe three fish. And then I was trying to, I was starting to uh, make the, and start to do things based on my, my common sense and trial and error. Because apparently a lot of the things that I was trying to do were not practiced before. Not only that they were not practiced, furthermore, there was no research, not even now, by the way, about the effect of colors and shapes on the biodiversity under the water. I'm not talking about out of the water. And I was trying to do some trials. So after dumping the rocks and building at least the, the basics, uh, the base for it, I was putting pictures. Furthermore, not only under the water, on the surface as well, saying that recreation is again a way uh, to provide livelihood and to economically promote and develop a place for people that could not make their living anymore just from the sea. And this is one of the examples. Uh, actually, I was, and most probably I will try it a little bit more to show it here. Uh, with, uh, with the tide, uh, 
equals. But this was another way of doing it. And this is an example of how it works. This is an, uh, this is an attempt, uh, not an attempt, actually, an experiment or demonstration made in Israel, the only one that I made in Israel, when I took stones or rocks, not, a bi not big ones, and put it in a very shallow place in the sea, Mediterranean. Now, practically, the Mediterranean is a completely, almost completely dead place. You have no di biodiversity. The fishing methods, mainly in Israel, by the way, were very tough and destroy any, any possible future for it. And I just dumped it in a bay where a lot of people, by the way, it was not deep. It was something like a three to four feet deep. People were running around. And then I dumped the stones with the pictures in it. And the only fish, really the only fish that was living in this bay, arrived to this place. By the way, this is just another uh, possibility of, this is under the water, which is another model. And this is the one in, uh, here in Oregon. When I say, okay, let's make things more interesting and start to create a natural galleries of things that practically people will not be able to see in very short time. But then I go back to this artificial, uh, it's not artificial, actually it's natural reef, uh, reef of a trying to, to really bring life somehow back. So beside putting the rocks and beside putting the pictures, you can always add and collect loose corals, loose sponges, whatever, just to plant it. Don't use glue, don't use nothing, just put it. Some of it will work, some of it will die. But eventually, you come to a point that you see now the quantity of fish that were gathering all around. You see the desert behind it, practically a desert. And at least we know that it works. The size of it depends on the budget that exists. And obviously it depends on uh, what is your goal. This is as far as I can talk about activities and my approach to conservation or, um, as, as I said, restoration rather than conservation, but at least because I believe that, in, uh, that everywhere, if you have some imagination, if you have some creativity, you can find the ways to do something to improve what was basically lost and uh, things are not getting better anyway, uh, anymore. Now, this, was an, uh, this is an example, uh, which is the best picture that I could take to make an example, what's wrong about a uh, human arrogancy trying to uh, restore or uh, make any kind of activities to rehabilitate or to be, recreate the marine environment. Now, the reef balls, it's a very well-known system, which I didn't make any comments about it, but I couldn't find the sense behind doing it. You see these concrete structures over there. This picture, by the way, was taken in the Philippines. There was a very big storm in this area. And then somebody convinced the local government to 
make this project of reef balls that made him earn a lot of money and he got a lot of money for doing it by uh, he, and he was explaining like uh, like it's explained all over in other places as well on the on these reef balls corals will grow again there are holes over there the fish will be able to hide and everything will be back to normal after six months and this picture was taken after six months i don't have to tell you how look the tomb uh, the tombstones over there at the back at the back at the background but there was over there a dead reef that after six months things started to grow on it without doing nothing just letting uh, nature to rehabilitate itself this is as far as really represent my idea about restoration with all the impacts around it and now let's go to photography and to art as i said i'm not a photographer technically i cannot do a uh, sharp works or accurate works or what i call national geographic pictures i'm limited with what equipment i can use i am limited what how much balance i can have and secondly this is not what was i was not interested in it and you can see the examples here if we take from left on the top, this is a picture that I saw. Practically, it's a very nice picture of a snail over a worm, but I don't find it very interesting. And I was looking actually at the small portion of it, which turns from just a natural thing into a kind of a I don't know if to call it art, but it looks like, uh, I don't know what. Same with the, the green one. It looks like a, like a coral, a soft coral, by the way. But uh, okay, but I don't find it uh, an, a very interesting. And I, when I was looking at it, I saw just a portion of it and said, this is a great maze. This is something very interesting. And then, this is what I see. Same on the other one. It's a nice coral. It has nice colors, but there is nothing in from my point of view. There was nothing interesting in it. And I was looking just on one spot. Furthermore, I will take this one as an example. I bumped into this. Uh, small thing which i don't even know how it is called and the first impression that i got was a little prince because it reminded me the picture of the little prince like in this book few years later not few something like almost 15 years later it came came this uh, nice covid and I say, wow, this is COVID. How come that the COVID existed under the water and nobody could see it? Maybe it came from there and not from the Chinese laboratories or whatever people were talking that it came from. And this is where I started to look. This is the way that I was looking at things, imagining already not only just to see what you see, but look behind it try to open up your imagination don't strict yourself to what is usually obvious same here i took the same covid and there was a picture of a coral which i said they can be integrated very nicely and eventually it became a picture 
in a bedroom of one of the people, uh, somebody that knows me, but he bought it for his bedroom. Same here. The one on the top, this is what I saw when I was under the water. But it, uh, okay, it's nice, but it's not that interesting. So I manipulated it, like you see, next to it, and then next to it, and it went to be a table, and then it, it became a plan to be under the water, under the, or the bottom of a swimming pool. The table exists, the pictures exist, the, these ones exist, the one in the swimming, is swimming pool does not, because the guy that wanted it didn't have enough money to make it. It's too, it was too damn expensive for him. And I can see his point, by the way, because it's really expensive. But there are smaller things that you can do. I will take this one. This is the original. It's a metal pool in a place where Provost Fazer and I used to dive a few times in Corazao, in the pier. You remember where the tugboat is? But okay, this is interesting, but it's not interesting enough. So I just take one part of it and it becomes an abstract that uh, very few people could say where it came from. And again, somebody decided that he likes it. He could afford it. And actually he had this one and there is another one like this in another place. Let's take the next one. This is what I saw under the water. But again, it's interesting, maybe, but not that interesting. So I took it and we made two other things out of it. And my imagination already, when I, when I was looking at this picture, I could see already where it can go. Let's take these samples as well. Like you see the green maze over there, what it was used for in office. You can see these are the various possibilities of how you look at things, to my opinion. The more interesting aspect of looking at things. And still I will go back to the restoration. In all these cases, one of my thoughts was about, okay, what can be done with this specific uh, image or color or shape out of the water and inside the water? Uh, inside the water, I showed you samples. By the way, in many cases, going back to restoration or to conservation, uh, one of the advantages of the way that I was looking at it and practicing it was that even in case that there is a storm and everything is destroyed, you are using natural materials, which can be whether it's glass or aluminum or something that will not cause any environmental damage. And it proved that it uh, can contribute to that. This just all the possibilities and the possible things that can be done from images from the sea and most probably will not stay there for long. And this is another aspect of why I was uh, playing with it because I knew that uh, lots of these uh, shapes and colors and people will not be able to see for long. So let's see how can we preserve it and do whatever we want out of it. 
pieces and one exhibition with his uh, kind of paintings. The one on the left, actually, it's few pictures that were that I was putting under the water, and just the waves were giving it uh, this kind of uh, view that looks again. You cannot describe exactly what is it, although if you are familiar, you can see the snail over there, and you can see some of the corals, but uh, practically, just be creative. We go back to the ability of nature to overcome any damages made by human. Again, we see here metal pools that nobody knows uh, why, why they are still there and what is uh, sometimes not even the reason why somebody put them in the first place. It takes time and eventually it becomes a piece of art that nature makes. Unfortunately, even these ones are not working so well and nature, with the global warming, by the way, finds it very difficult to overcome the destruction or the conditions of the sea. And you can hardly see when you, when you go today, and this is not for, from many years ago, but if you go today and you look at the same thing, you see something growing on the garbage, but not much. Okay, this is now just to give you an idea about images that you can take out if you just use your imagination and look at the things. The one on the bottom, on the left, on the right, your right, sorry. This is not the real color of anemone, but then we go back to art. I was asked to participate in a competition for, for I think it was 400 years to uh, Alighieri. The Italian uh, author. And I took the Dante, the Inferno part of his story. And this is what I said. It was accepted. So maybe people see, were thinking that it's right, the right way to describe it. On the top, you can see again, garbage that becomes kind of a piece of art because the coral is a, or whatever plants is overcoming it. And here, I have nothing to say. You can just watch it and decide if you like it or not. This is an example. This is one coral fan, which I was playing with the colors because I didn't like the original color. So for design, came out like this one looked ni a little bit nicer. And here you have all the samples of what you can get when you really concentrate not on the, what I call the, the underwater scene, which is nice and interesting, but this is not what I know to, to do well. And this is not what really interests me. I think that with this one, we saw enough. By the way, this is an expression about human invasion. The one on the left, the one on the bottom. The other one, somebody created it. I didn't do, I have to do nothing. Somebody dropped chain. The chain there is connected to something that doesn't move and will not move anymore, but nobody is moving it out. And with this, I ended my 
thing you can do, you can ask whatever you want. You can say whatever you want. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amos, for sharing with us. I wanted to see if we have any questions online. All right, for those online, if you'd like to put any questions in the chat, feel free to do so. For folks in the room, do we have any questions from our participants here? All right, Ichang, do you wanna come down to the mic? You'll need to turn that one on. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, your images were um, stunning to say the least. Um, and particularly those last images uh, incorporating um, the impacts of humans uh, in these environments. And uh, looking over your work um, through the SEEDS program, very impressive. Uh, and super excited to hear about the work that you've been doing in Curacao, uh, particularly since uh, our Marine Science Center has been working on uh, a COIL course with the University of Aruba um, in making and educating our students here at OSU and Aruba around some of these same issues around economic development, conservation issues, and restoration. Um, I'm curious to know um, your project and the way that you incorporate uh, the, I guess, the, the, the process uh, through SEEDS uh, in working with groups and communities to get them to develop sustainable practices, uh, um, ecotourism, um, sustainable economic development uh, is very challenging in these island states. From what I've learned just in the last two years in developing this, this COIL course with University of Aruba and some of my other colleagues here, how do you deal with governments that, I mean, I know the, the biggest challenges in those, in that particular Southern Caribbean area um, is the, the challenges of governments not necessarily putting that as a priority because the tourism dollars are so important for those communities to, to, to survive, yet those are the same practices that impact their environment and their livelihood over the long term. So how do you deal with, with those governments? How do you deal with that political piece? I understand this question. Okay. We have, uh, when it comes to deal with governments, it's uh, very uh, entertaining and very funny because governments usually had a problem and when it comes to me and I think that this is a approach that usually should you should adapt if you want to achieve something with governments don't tell them that they are wrong don't tell politicians that they are wrong don't tell them that they do don't know what they do don't tell them that they make mistakes and don't tell them that they are corrupted you just show it, show, I have to try and show them how they are going to benefit out of what you are suggesting. And in the first place, try to make them the ones asking you for advice. The subject in Curacao was a good example, by the way, talking about Aruba, if you will look at the website, we didn't put the name of it, but never mind. Later on, I will give it to you. You will see that there is a work about uh, over there or a presentation that we were doing, trying to present the, the concept of seed in developing islands. And this one was uh, the presentation was made by your provost. Uh, and it was dealing with Aruba as an example of how you develop tourism, but the wrong way, sort of. Meaning to say, you have a place like Aruba that has certain advantages, and what you try to do in Aruba is actually to imitate Miami Beach. And what happened there is that practically the only ones that are benefiting out of it 
are the owners of the hotels and some officials in the government. In most cases, and I will take Corazao as an example. Fortunately, I was asked to give advice to the foundation over there, Karmabi. Practically, Karmabi was the foundation that was responsible for research, a, for natural na nature conservation, and be as advisor to the government about any development activities that they were doing there. And, and they were managing also, by the way, the national parks in Corazao. Uh, I was about to leave Corazao because I was invited for another issue. And then I was approached by somebody who used to be a nice person, a very talented one. You were the head of the financial department of Corazao. And he was telling me, Amos, listen, we have a problem. The government doesn't have any more money. The foundation will vanish. I think that you can do something to save it. And after one night, I told him, okay. And I agreed. And I took the advantages of the island itself, the natural environment, the weather conditions, which are very unique in Corazao. By the way, in Aruba, the same. Changing lately, but still much better than the northern part of the Caribbean. And started to, develop, to, to look what can be done in order to, first of all, to allow the foundation to create sources of income, which for me, which, and, and I was not, uh, I did not come from the academical uh, world, but it seemed to me obvious that how come that till today, they don't turn this place as an attraction for all the people that are working in tropical marine environment, research, study, whatever, study abroad programs, because they are ideal. It's a place that the natural environment was still good. Not all over, but in most cases was still in good condition. You could have weather, you, you had weather conditions that allowed you to work actually all year round. Not rainy seasons, not stormy season, not nothing. And nothing was done about it. The problem was, as you were asking, ego problems within the foundation, which is the one system. Other one, the foundation, and this is one thing that happens, by the way, sometimes also with the academic world, that they, had this, they have the tendency of uh, being, how should I put it, being very unnice or annoying to the political to, to the to the to the politicians and many times to the local constructors or developers or whatever. Although again I'm coming back, prove them what how they can benefit out of what you suggest rather than try to stop their activities or their desires or whatever they whatever they do. Again, we come back to the human factor, which I forgot to mention, that one of the things which is the most important one when you come to any kind of restoration, rehabilitation, conservation, development, is the human factor. You ignore the human factor, most probably you will fail. And human factor means that you have to, whether you like it or not, uh, being corrupt, it's within the human nature. I was looking, uh, and I experienced it a lot, and I'm not talking about corruption at the levels that we see in the modern world. I'm talking about the third world, or what we call the undeveloped nations, 
when you see an official of the government that his average salary and he's in a high position will be something like 1,000 US dollars per month. And he knows that with his signature, he can see that somebody will get a budget of 20, 50, or 100 million dollars. Obviously, he would like to get a piece of the cake. Now, you can say it's unacceptable, it's illegal, and I don't think it's right. But then let's see where, he, where it will take you. Once, if you convince him that if, if he will sign what he has to sign and will perform, he can benefit so much, so much, because he can put so many people from his family within the project because they will contribute to it, but it will exist. He will do it. Uh, uh, basically, uh, and I will go back to Aruba in, in, in this regard. Aruba had a chance in the past to develop the, the what we call the ecotourism in Aruba, but they were too concentrated in developing the big hotels on the big white empty beaches because they were building on the cruise ships that are arriving there, leaving nothing on the island practically, or people that were coming to stay in the big hotels, which eventually later on, in uh, parentheses, thanks to the incident with the American student, they lost the tourism from the US. You know what I'm talking about, or shall I tell you the story? Anyway, a few, uh, I think it was something like a little bit more than 10 years ago, an American student, because Aruba was a place that a lot of American tourists used to come. And then some, I think it was 10 or a little bit more years ago, an American student vanished there. They were suspecting that she was murdered, they were they didn't know if she was murdered, and it was a big issue in the States as well. And they, practically the tourism from the States stopped for many years. But they did nothing when it comes again. They were developing these big hotels. They were, they were, they were investing in putting up golf courses. But when it comes to the environmental or the ecotourism that could provide, naturally, by the way, could provide a lot of livelihood to a wider range of, uh, of the population, they didn't do it. And the question is today, if they still have something that can be done about it, because I am not familiar with what is going on today in the waters of Aruba. Uh, I know about uh, two other islands within this uh, Dutch empire, one is Corasau that doesn't look very good. The other one that used to look much better is Bonaire. And Bonaire has the same problem. They had a very good and strong and professional conservation uh, institute and research institute that uh, for political reasons, I believe, lost its power. And as far as I know, from people that I still talk to in this island, that was, by, by the way, one of the best preserved ones that uh, the last few years, they are dis destroying any nice, good piece of the beach. It's not as in the States, by the way, where you cannot build wherever you want. You cannot put up your house on the beach. You cannot put your restaurant wherever you want. You are uh, on this one. The the U.S. is, uh, ma is in much better condition. Not only the Bonaire, even uh, even then my own country Israel, which is a disaster when it comes to these issues. Did it answer your question, or you need some more explanation? <laughs>
question. Why don't you come and talk to the discussion? For those folks on the line, you are welcome to reach out um, and connect with those questions as well. But before we all go, can we just say thank you very much for all the speakers? Thank you.